Better wake up, man. I do want to welcome those that are watching online all over the country. Special shout out and welcome to our Lowell, Massachusetts campus right outside of Boston. Come on, let's let our family know that they mean a lot to us. Last week, they didn't get to uh, meet in person because of uh, the weather and the snow, and it was kind of crazy for them up there, but we're glad that you guys are back at the YMCA gathered together. We're in uh, unison with the Holy Spirit. We are one as Christ and the Father are one, and so we're just believing the Holy Spirit is with you as he is with us, connecting us together because the Holy Spirit is not limited by a location. Can I get an amen, right? Um, As many of you know, uh, for 2024, this is the year of surrender, really the year of complete surrender. And if you weren't here last week, I just want to give you uh, the pitch. I just want you to come on this journey with us uh, where you surrender every really part of your life to God. And this would be the year that you would do that. And I really want to encourage you to make church attendance a priority. Like, like go ahead and make that decision today. That like, and maybe this isn't your home church or whatever, and that's fine. But I'm telling you, as your church attendance gets sporadic, your life gets chaotic. And that's just how it is. And there's something about meeting in person. And online is great when you're, you know, you're sick, you're out of town to keep you connected. Um, but there's nothing like being in the room. Amen. There's nothing like experiencing the family of God together when we come together, pray together, worship together, we receive a word together. And so I want to encourage you to prioritize church attendance uh, this year as we seek together to surrender every aspect of our lives. And then I also want to just remind you that for the next two Wednesday nights, we have prayer nights. All right, these are, where, these are nights where we come in for a power hour and we just present our requests to the Lord. And we give you 20 minutes to kind of pray on your own. I give a devotional. We have worship. It's really like a worship and prayer night. Uh, you don't have to pray out loud, and we don't put you on the stage and call you out or anything like that. Uh, but it is a very powerful night that if you want to encounter the presence of God, I promise you, it'll be here Wednesday night from 7 to 8 p.m., and you'll leave changed. And so I want to encourage you. Last week I told you I'd give you, uh, or I would challenge you to make two out of the three. So if you weren't there at this last one, hello, you got to be, uh, you got perfect attendance in the next two, all right? So I need you to get to uh, the house. So we are excited about that. This series that we're in, um, we are calling it My Next Trip Around the Sun because the reality is that we are all on a trip together around the sun. And in fact, 14 days in to this trip around the sun, we have already traveled together 22.4 million miles together, yo. I mean, that's crazy when you think about it. I mean, we are just moving around the sun. And by the end of our journey, after 365 days, uh, we will have traveled 584 miles together. And, and the assignment that God put on my heart and, and, and for us this year was How will we begin the year talking about some things that would make this the best trip we've ever had around the sun? Because a lot of us have taken this trip before, but we've taken it and we've been oblivious to it. And this year, we want to tap into the power and the potential of this trip. And so this series is really coming from uh, Job 11, 13 through 18, and we read this last week, but I want to put everybody on the same page for today's message. It says this, surrender your heart to God. Turn to him in prayer and give up your sins, even those you do in secret. So those, that's the premise, right, that you would surrender your heart to God every day. I challenge you to start your day off by saying, God, I surrender everything to you. I surrender my hands, my eyes, my ears, every part of my life to you. Then I'm going to turn to him in prayer, and then I'm going to give up my sins, even the ones that nobody knows about. And then here is the promise. So that's the premise God's saying, if you'll do this, then I will do this right here. He says, then you won't be ashamed. You'll be confident and fearless. Your troubles will go away like water beneath a bridge, and your darkest night will be brighter than noon. You will rest safe and secure, filled with hope and emptied of worry. And I just want to encourage you to put that scripture somewhere, if it's in your Bible, uh, on your, you know, your light stand, um, somewhere where you can see it, um, because that is our verse for the year. And I promise you, if you do those three things, uh, surrender your heart, man, uh, I, God is going to honor it. He's going to have your, his hand of favor on uh, your life. I hope that your 21 days of prayer and fasting is going well. Um, we have 14 days left, and I want to encourage you, 
uh, to, to stay strong in that. If you've fallen off, if you've, you know, messed up and ate a lifesaver or something like that, like just chill, it's okay, no worries. Uh, you know, I think about fasting sometimes, especially if you're a new believer or you're new to fasting, you know, you're kind of like a baby that's learning to walk. And what does a baby do? Sometimes a baby will fall over, but you, what are you tell them, get back up, right? You gotta keep learning. And so I wanna encourage you to stay strong, stay committed to the Lord, and he'll have his hand of favor on you. In this season of surrender, in this season of taking this trip together, what I really want to help you do, especially today, is I want to help you develop healthy habits uh, that are going to make this the best trip around the sun. The reality is some of us have uphill dreams with downhill habits, and you're never going to reach the full potential that God has for you uh, the, the way that your habits are today. And so what I would say is habit God's way. You know, you need to make sure that you're doing things the way of the Lord. And one of the best things that you can learn at the beginning of this year to make this the best year yet is learn how to make wise decisions. And so I want to preach a message to you. I'm just calling making wise decisions. The reality is we are a product of the decisions that we make day in and day out. I don't know about you, but one of the things that really gets me going is when I get lost. Like, like when I'm in a car, um, and, and maybe let's say I miss an exit, you know, and it's like, oh man, now I gotta go to all the way to the next exit, and then I gotta turn around, and like, I'm just like, I'm up in arms because I, I could be here, and like, now I gotta come all the way back, and I'll never forget when Lauren and I we're in college, and we were just dating. Uh, we actually looked like this. I brought a picture just so you could see how we, uh, this was us in our dating life. Um, if anybody wants to start bringthefroback.com, we'll uh, take a vote on it. And uh, Should I bring it back? Yeah, I mean, uh, nah, nah. The Bible says put away childish things, y'all, uh, so... Uh, I was looking at that earlier, and I was thinking, man, if I looked that bad and got the favor of the Lord to have a beautiful wife, hello, somebody. I was living right back then. So, But anyways, when we were uh, in college, uh, Lauren oftentimes would like to drive. In fact, I'd, I don't really like to drive, so when we go on long trips, she drives. Um, and I'll never forget, we were dating, um, and it was my first time in Philadelphia. Now, I'm from Davie County, right? Like, I'm, I'm hanging with the cows, you know? Like, that's how I roll. Like, I don't roll big city, uh, but she's taking me into Philly, and we're gonna go get cheese steaks, and it's gonna be, uh, you know, awesome, and I'll never forget um, one of the first times we're in Philly, and she takes a wrong turn that takes us over this big monumental bridge into New Jersey, and there's like no way back, right? So it's like, we're going into Philly, and she's like, I'm like, Philly's back this way, and we're going over this bridge that takes probably about three minutes to cross, uh, to, and it takes you into New Jersey. Well, once we get into New Jersey, she takes another wrong turn, and, and now it's starting to get dark, and then she takes another wrong turn, and another wrong, I mean, it's just getting out of control, people, about six or seven wrong turns, and I'm in an alley thinking she's trying to take me out. <laughs> And it was just one of those things where she just couldn't make the right turn. It was like she made one wrong, you know, turn, and then it just kind of led down. And the next thing you know, we are seriously in a dark alley in a place that is, like, unfamiliar to me. I'm, like, clicking my heels like I just want to go home, like, what, like, get me out of here. And, you know, she's a little bit panicking. And, like, and, and I just thought about that, and that describes... A lot of us, where we are today, because of the product of the decisions that we've made, we just made one bad decision in our youth, and then that led to another bad decision, which led to another bad decision, and another wrong turn, and another fork in the road, and bad decision, and then all of a sudden, we're in a space and place that we didn't ever think that God would allow us to be in, but it's because we are a product of our decisions, and my assignment today is to teach you how to make wise decisions based on God's word so that you can experience, listen to me, sustained spiritual success. Not that you won't have troubles, just when troubles come, you know how to navigate because you've got the Holy Spirit leading you, you've got God's word speaking into you, and now you have the wisdom to be able to make wise decisions in a life that is very chaotic 
at times. So one of the most important things you will ever learn, listen to me, and you're, ne- you're you know, it's, it's never too late to start making wise decisions, amen? amen? I mean, you think about Paul who made terrible decisions up until he was 30 years old. And at 30 years old, he, you know, became a Christian um, and he began to make wise decisions there and God restored his years and used him to write over half the New Testament. So you're never, it's never too late to, to, to begin to make wise decisions. James 1, 7 and 8 says this, a person unable to make up his mind and undecided in all he does must not think he will receive anything from the Lord. And so somebody that's not able to make wise decisions, somebody who's not able to you know, calculate what God is speaking to them and make those decisions, you're not gonna receive anything from the Lord. And listen to me, I've got friends, I've got family, I've got people that I know who they're in the church building every week. They're in a seat somewhere in America worshiping God, yet they have no clue how to make wise, godly decisions. And then they wonder, it's like, well, I've been in church. Well, I, you know, I, you know, I, I love Jesus, uh, but they can't make wise decisions. I don't know if you know anybody like that in your family, in your, in your friend's circle, but it's gotta be more than about church attendance. Again, we wanna prioritize that. But at the end of the day, uh, there's a way for you to make wise, godly decisions. Now, now it's a lot easier said than done. You know why this? Do you know this? You, you actually make 35,000 decisions a day, conscious decisions, 35,000. I, I like did my calculator because I'm terrible at math. I'm like one of those ones, like if math, you're so smart, why don't you do it on your own? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> In a year, you will make almost 13 million conscious decisions. And how many know like one wrong decision? And so we can't afford to find ourselves in a moment where we're not surrendered and submitted to God because we are always making decisions. And we are a product of those decisions. One decision can affect your destiny in a good way or a bad way. The decision to ask her to marry you, uh, the decision to say yes, the decision to accept a job offer, to start a business or sell a business or relocate to a different state or different part of the state or the decision to go home with him at nighttime or the decision to attend church and be uh, grounded and rooted in the house of God. The word decide actually comes from a Latin word that means to cut off. And so what that means when it's decided, it's almost like you come into a fork in the road. You've got A or you've got B, and when you choose A, you're cutting off B and you're making a decision. Think about how one decision can change the course of your life. There's a lot of pressure in this, and I'm not trying to put that weighty pressure. I'm just trying to help you realize, but one decision can, can, can change your destiny. I mean, just think about Adam and Eve. One decision. Like, like the reason why we are fallen, the reason why everyone is infected with this disease called sin will all trace back to one decision that was made in the garden. I think about David, a man after God's own heart fell into an affair. And then that led him to trying to cover up and then to murder. And again, one bad decision leads to another, leads to another. Think about Judas who followed Jesus closely for three years and then one bad decision. I bet there's some people in here who, in sports, we, we say it like this, if we make a, if a bad shot, bad pass, whatever, or we say, I'd like to have that one back, you know? In fact, I took my... Um, I travel baseball team down to the Gulf Coast World Series. It was a perfect game tournament, the biggest you know, 8U tournament in the nation. And I'll never forget, we uh, made it all the way to the semifinals, uh, should have been in the finals, uh, but I made a mistake as a third base coach that still today, I mean, we're six months out. I mean, I'm just a competitive guy. I'm Monday morning quarterback. I'm always thinking about how we can get better. But still to this day, I'm saying to myself, man, I wish I'd have had that one back. And I just wonder, are there anybody in here, when it comes to your life, you wish you would have a certain moment back, like you wish you had never smoked that first cigarette, 
Wish you would have never put that first, like, dip in your mouth because now it's like, you know, you can't live without it. And if I told you to go 30 days without it, you would just, ah. Which is an indication that you're addicted to it. And anything we're surrendered to other than the Holy Spirit is sin. I wonder if anybody wish you hadn't have taken that first drink, looked at that first magazine, or clicked on that first site online. I'm telling you, the decisions you make today will affect your destiny tomorrow. And it's never too late to start today to make wise decisions. I love how the message paraphrase says James 1, 14 and 15. It says, the temptation to give into evil comes from us and only us. We have no one to blame but the leering, seducing flare-up of our own lust. In other, words, in other words, what he's saying here is we can't blame the devil for everything. <laughs> like, like, you ever meet these people? It's the devil's fault. The devil got me. You know, it's like I fell into that. It's the devil's fault. He's just roaring lion just right there. It's the devil's fault. It's not the devil's fault. The devil is the one that provides the trap, provides the temptation, but come on, somebody. God always provides you a way out. And so when you're submitted and surrendered, there's gonna be temptation, but you'll see the way out. And so at the end of the day, we are a product of the decisions and the free will that, that we decide. He goes on to say that lust gets pregnant. I like this imagery. Lust gets pregnant and has a baby, and that baby is sin, and sin grows up to adulthood and becomes a real killer. In other words, sin always starts small. It always starts small. And then what does it do? It begins to manifest itself. It begins to grow in your heart into something. Now it's, you know, a stronghold. It started as a, you know, foothold. And now God, or, or, or now the enemy really does have us. And your flesh has you. And this is the year of surrender. And, and I'm asking, I'm declaring. Some of you, you've been trying for years to break. And I'm talking about everything from alcohol to pills to food to sugar. I'm, I'm talking about it all. Like, it's time to surrender it and, and release it all to God this year and give it over to him. But sin always starts small. An affair almost always starts with a message on Facebook or a DM in Instagram or a flirtatious comment that you shouldn't have made in the break room. It starts small, and then it begins to manifest itself. An addiction starts with one hit here, one pill here, one drink here. Sin will always take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you ever want to pay. And our decisions follow us into the future. I think about like this. The sum total of my decisions throughout my life is going to tell a story. In other words, I, I don't know, sometimes I picture, you know, hey, I'm on my deathbed and I'm not trying to be doom and gloom. I'm just trying to tell you how my mind works. Is I'm on my deathbed and I'm looking back over the product, uh, you know, the decisions that I made and I think about that moment and I think in that moment what my life's gonna tell the story. My decisions are gonna tell, tell a story. And I ask myself, what kind of story do I wanna tell? And that's the life that I want to live. It, it helps me to prioritize decisions. Every time I've told you this before, but some of you are new here, when I don't preach or you know, somebody's you know, filling in the pulpit and I'm still here and still navigating, a lot of times I will go back to kids' house and I thank the volunteers back there. That's you know, priority number one. But then priority number two is to look at all the faces of the kids and I'm reminded in that moment that one wrong decision by me will affect every one of those kids. Because I cannot afford to have an affair. I cannot afford to step out of God's will in that way. Because if I do that, one, that's gonna affect you, it's gonna affect our church, and then it's gonna affect the trajectory of those kids. And so, listen, I'm not trying to put weight and pressure on you, I'm just trying to tell you the reality of where I am, and there's weight and pressure with, with, with your decisions as well, but 
I say that to say is there's four principles that I try to navigate my decisions through that I want to help you with, um, and maybe um, you'll find this valuable. So four principles when faced with a decision um, that, that, that'll help you make a wise decision. Um, and out of my 14 years of leading this church, um, I've never had to lean into these principles uh, more, okay? So the first one when faced with a decision that you've got to make um, is to ask God for his wisdom. We're gonna ask for godly wisdom. We're gonna ask for God's wisdom. This is, this is a prayer that many people don't pray that you need to get in <laughs> your arsenal, okay? And you, it, right after you surrender to God, the next thing you need to do is ask God for his wisdom. Wisdom. Proverbs 28, 26 says, a man is foolish to trust himself, but those who use God's wisdom, check it out, are safe. Now, if there was someone in the Bible who knew that their decision-making would be impact future events, it would be a guy named Solomon, who happens to be, per the Bible, per God's word, the wisest man to ever live. Solomon was chosen to replace David as king, and God spoke to Solomon in a dream and, and basically came to him like a genie in the bottle and said, you can ask me for anything and I'll grant it. Can you imagine that? Like, what would your answer be if you had one wish? Well, what, what is it that you would ask for? And let's look at this scripture. It's a little bit lengthy, but I wanna show you this, um, th- this encounter uh, between Solomon and the Lord. This is found in 1 Kings chapter 3, 7 uh, through 9. It says this, Now, O Lord, my God, you have made me king instead of my father, David, but I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. In other words, he's you know, trying to navigate this new position. He says, I am here in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation so great and numerous they cannot be counted. And then he says this, give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? And so when God says, hey, I'll give you anything you want, what did he ask for? He asked for wisdom and understanding. Here's what God replied in verse 11. It says, so God replied, because you asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice, and have not asked for long life or wealth or the death of your enemies. Like, that's what normal people would ask for. He says, I will give you what you ask for. I will give you wise and an understanding heart, such as no one has ever had or ever will have. That's why we believe that he's the wisest man who ever lived. And I will also give you what you did not ask for. I love it, riches and fame. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. <clears throat> and so he kn- knew to ask for wisdom. So you gotta get wisdom. You wanna make good decisions? Come on, you need wisdom from God. And it's godly wisdom, not worldly wisdom. The world thinks they know everything about everything and how to navigate, you know. And I'm telling you, you, you gotta ask God before Google, right? Right? I mean, some of you, I mean, let's, let's be real. That's, the, that's your go-to. That's the first thing you do. It's like you're stressed out, you're maxed out, you're trying to figure out, you know, like, you, you know, you're in a situation and so you just start Googling like, um, you know, what's the best way to deal with my difficult in-laws? Now, I've never had to type that. But maybe some of you have and so we're looking up stuff about, you know, how to deal with uh, in-laws or, how, how, you know, how, how do we discipline our kids and, uh, you know, and then we're getting worldly wisdom in how to, you know, discipline our kids. How do we handle conflict with coworkers? And we're going to, to Google for all this thing. Or some, it's like, oh man, I got, got a little bump on my arm. And it's like, you're looking that up and looking that picture up. And then next thing you know, you're on WebMD, like, and you're like, it's cancer. I know it's cancer. And WebMD said it. And, and then you're just like, freaking out. Come on, somebody, ask God before you ask Google, right? Like, go to him. You got to desire godly wisdom from him. And so Solomon would go on to write this right here, Proverbs 4, 7, and 8. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. Whatever else you do, develop good judgment. If your prize wisdom 
She will make you great. That's why I'm trying. I want you to have a great year. And it's going to come from making wise decisions. Embrace her and she will honor you. Ask God for wisdom first. Now, if there was anybody who could lean on their own understanding, right? Anybody who could make wise decisions, who would it be? It would be Solomon, right? Because Solomon is the wisest man ever. So if there's anybody who could kind of lean on their own judgment, their own understanding, it would be Solomon. But Solomon is the one who wrote this scripture right here in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And the wisest man who ever lived wrote this right here. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. So even the wisest man who ever lived knew that you can't trust your own judgment. You can't follow your heart. You need godly wisdom. To make great decisions, you need godly wisdom. Number two, you gotta trust what scripture says. We are not gonna make decisions based on our feelings. We're not gonna make decisions based on our emotions what society deems is okay. No, we're gonna trust scripture. We're gonna trust God's word. Come on, God's word, this is not just like words on a page. It's not just a manual for life. Come on, this is the very breath of God on a page, breathing oxygen into your lungs, keeping you alive, because this word is alive and active. And the more tattered and tethered your Bible is, the less tattered and tethered your life is. And the better decisions you will make. We want to trust what Scripture says. Now, to trust what Scripture says, you got to know what it says. Come on, you got to open it up and read it. Don't tell me God is silent when your Bible's closed. A lot of times we're like, I'm having a hard time, you know, hearing the voice of the Lord. Well, when's the last time you opened your Bible? Because he's speaking every day through his word. Oftentimes, the wisdom that we need for the day from God is found in the scripture that we chose not to read that morning. It was there for you. You just didn't make a very good decision to open up the word and read it. Reading the Bible, especially in these uncertain times, is essential, essential to making great decisions, great life decisions. This is where God speaks to us. And its effect really takes root, especially first thing in the morning, if you'll read in the morning. It's the first fruits of the day. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, all scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Listen, we're in a, in a world right now that does not know what truth is. I mean, we're calling boys girls and girls boys and we're, you know, just running with society and we think, you know, just whatever society, whatever the world says, what about what God's word says? And what about being led not by the world's spirit but the Holy Spirit? And we're just saying, well, that's your truth. And so, no, 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 no. This is truth. And, and like we as believers have got to take a stand, not in a mean way, not in an arrogant way, but in a humble way, we got to stand on God's word. He goes on to say it corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Psalm 119 says, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. So God will speak to you in that. Even in the gray areas of life, he'll make an impression on you. So somebody might say, well, like, you know, the Bible doesn't really tell me if I should take that job or not, or if I should marry him or her or or not. What should I do with my life? Should I relocate? Should I buy this house? Or should I start this business? Or, you know, what school should I send my kids to? Should they go to UNC or Duke? And it's like, you don't got to pray about that one. (laughs) Jesus cast out devils. That's all I got to say. Like, I mean, point taken. (laughs) 
And so what do I do when I don't quite, you know, it seems like a gray area. Oftentimes reading God's word, he'll impress upon your heart an answer, and through the Holy Spirit, he'll speak to your mind and speak to your heart and give you the answer. Sometimes it doesn't quite happen that way, and so you'll need number three, which is to trust what my spiritual community says. Now, I'm gonna tell you what. If you don't have a spiritual community, you say, well, what is the spiritual community? I'm talking about the right people around you, encouraging you in the word of God, encouraging you in the Holy Spirit, uplifting you, praying for you, cheering for you, holding you accountable, picking you up when you're down, challenging you when you might be in an area of sin, You've given permission to, I'm talking about spiritual counsel. I'm talking about somebody who loves you, who loves Jesus, loves his church, loves God's word. You've got to have some people like that around you or you will begin to isolate and that's when the enemy attacks the most. This, this is the year you've got, you've got to get into a small group. You've got to get around some folks who just love Jesus and love you. And, and, and listen, it takes work and it takes, you know, you take being intentional and you making that decision. But I'm telling you, just coming to church and sitting in a seat is not good enough. You're going to get a good word that inspires you for about 72 hours that you forget about 90% of it. But when you're in a small group, you get friends <laughs> and community that encourage you and spur you on together. And so I'm encouraging you to, to get in a small group. Maybe you're in here and you wanna lead a small group. You need to get with Clint, who uh, is leading our small group's ministry. Get with him, tell him, I wanna lead a small group. We'll get you in. We're gonna launch those February 4th. And you need to get in on that. And, and you need spiritual community around you. I've said it, my whole ministry, right voices, right choices. If you've got the right voices speaking into you, you'll make right choices. Show me the five most dominant voices in your life and I'll show you and I can tell you what your life looks like right now. Just by your circle of friends. I can tell you where you are now. I can tell you where you're headed. Just because of your friend group. So we need to trust what our spiritual community says. So when I've got a big decision to make, I can lean into spiritual counsel from my spiritual community. What do you think about that? And then when two or three of them begin to line up and they're saying the same things, oftentimes you can go, wow, I think, I think God is in that. And as I'm trusting scripture, I've asked God for wisdom, I'm trusting spiritual counsel, then you're able to make a wise decision. The wrong people, though, become distracting, destructive, and poisonous. That's why you need, if somebody in here, you've got a friend group that just keeps dragging you down, keeps leading you away from the things of God. I'm talking to our young people as well. It's, you gotta cut them off. And you gotta set a boundary. And you gotta find some people who love you and love Jesus and love his church. And that's gotta become your, your circle for, for a while. And I get, you know, the whole thing, we need to be salt and light and we need to have lost people. I've got my one. I've got a couple people, you know, but my 95% of my group is, is followers of Jesus. And then I, I do outreach and I go to places that you probably wouldn't think a pastor would go to, but I'll, I, I will go and I'll be a light. It's intentional, okay? Number four, if you wanna make a wise decision and final one, Daniel, you want to come, you can. It's to submit to the Lord. The wisest man who ever lived, he wrote the scripture, right? He said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. How many of your ways? You mean just some of your ways? No, all your ways. Every part of your life. Surrendered and submitted to God, and he will make your paths straight. So all my ways, I'm talking about my finances, my attitude, the way you raise children, the way you spend your time, the way you choose to use your gifts, the way you handle your possessions, the way you conduct yourself, 
you trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways submit to him. That's the premise. Check out the promise. And he will make your paths straight. I told you that like one decision could make all the difference in your life. I want you to know that my brother and I who are in ministry and God has had his hand of favor um, on our family. Um, and that is because I had parents who made wise, godly decisions. Like every day, and, and like, and they will tell you they weren't the most versed in the Bible. They never taught a Bible study. They never, you know, preached God's word. But they, they knew and they were submitted to the Lord in a way that they just, they made such wise decisions with my brother and I. I'll never forget that there was a family friend who became really a part of our family. His name was Larry. He became Brad's piano teacher, voice teacher. He, you know, traveled with Brad. He was in his own Southern Gospel group. And Brad sang from a young time and just years and years, I mean, he just became part of our family. And so, um, I mean, this was over several years and probably about five, six years into it, you know, we're at our house one night, we're just, we had this big setup with music equipment and Brad would sing and practice and Larry would come over and play on the piano and um, it was just awesome. I mean, we, we would go out to eat with Larry. We would, you know, again, he was just a part, he was, he was our family. And one night, my brother had a concert the next morning, so it was Saturday night, and my brother had a concert at his church about 30 minutes away. Um, and so he just said, you know, just randomly, hey, you guys wanna come over and spend the night with me tonight? And like, come on over, and we'll get up and we'll go to Brad's concert, and everybody will meet there in the morning. And of course, my brother and I, we were like, we're, we are in, let's go. We, we've never been to Larry's house, like, let's go. And, and in that moment, my mom was like, I, we're not gonna do that. And, I, and we just, we begged her. Like, I mean, like little kids do. I mean, I think I was 10, Brad was probably 13. And we're like, mom, you know? And then we started kind of maybe saying like, even, I think I even remember me saying something like, you're the worst mom. Like as a like nine or 10 year old would do, you know? Like, I even remember in that moment, I think that she even like cried a little bit like on that decision. So obviously we didn't get to go to Larry's house that night. We were bummed as kids and didn't really understand that decision. But a couple years later, my mom gets mailed a newspaper article. And in that newspaper article, is an article of Larry who was charged with 16 counts of molestation. All of them, little boys. And I'm just so thankful that I had a mom and a dad submitted to the Lord to make wise decisions because your decisions matter. And your decisions, face, they, they create your future and they don't just affect you. Your decisions affect the people around you. And I'm here to tell you, 2024, submit and surrender to the Lord and make wise decisions. And if you do that, God will make your path straight. I'm a product of that. I'm, my life's not perfect. I'm not perfect. I got a long ways to go. But when I think about where my brother and I are and where our family is and how God has blessed me, I mean, I put that picture up there and I make fun of it, but I do feel like I have, God's given me a beautiful wife, beautiful wisdom and beautiful children. And sometimes I think about that one decision that my mom made to protect could that have been the decision that made our paths straight? I wanna encourage you, make wise decisions.
Would you pray with me, church? Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for what you're doing in our house. God, I just pray for our hearts. God, I pray for our lives. God, I pray that you would give us the desire to, to make wise decisions, to, to, the desire to seek wisdom from you. God, that this would be the best year yet, but not because we just ask you to have your hand of favor on us, but because we're, we're putting in our part where we're making decisions to be obedient to you. And God, I pray that we would prioritize our church, prioritize community, prioritize asking you for wisdom and trusting your scripture, God, and submitting to you in all our ways. So God, I'm asking you to just send your Holy Spirit, snuff out the world's spirit and send your Holy Spirit to lead and to guide us. With every head bowed, with every eye closed, I, I can't leave here without giving you a chance to make the wisest decision you've ever made, to place your faith in Jesus, to, to repent of your sin and to, to walk in a newness of life. And I just believe that God brought you here to make that decision. You've come to a fork in the road and you can decide to place your faith in him or you can cut off that decision. When you make this decision, you not only are forgiven of your sin, but you're, you're given what's the Holy Spirit to, to be able to make wise decisions. You're also given a home in heaven so if you're here today and you've never made that decision, or maybe you're here today and you are a Christian, but, but man, you, you need God to make your path straight. You need to come back to the Lord. This is for you as well. So if that's you today, you need to repent of your sin. You need to say, man, I'm, I've been going the wrong way. I've been, you know, I wanna break this addiction and I wanna give it all over to you. I wanna surrender to you. I'm just gonna help you with the words. You just pray this silently in your heart. If it expresses the sincere desire of your heart, you will be saved. If you're coming back to the Lord, he'll make your path straight. Don't, don't bow out of this decision today because you're a product of it. Lean into what the Holy Spirit is leading you to do. Just pray this with me. God, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And I thank you for sending your son Jesus to make a way for me. God, I ask you to for, forgive me of my sin, past, present, and future. God, today I, I come back to you and I wanna make you the Lord of my life. And I promise, God, to live for you all the days of my life surrendered the best way With every eye closed, with every head bowed. If you prayed that prayer, I'm just gonna ask you to take it one step further. I'm not gonna ask you to stand. Nobody's looking around, but I do wanna see you because I wanna pray for you. If you prayed that prayer to place your faith in Jesus or you just made it today to say, hey, I made a decision for Christ today to, to make my path straight, to get back on the right track with him. I just want you to slip your hand up when I say three. One, two, three. Lift it high all over this place. Amen. Just leave it high. That's awesome. Leave it high. So I'm gonna pray for you. I see you. Father, I thank you for these decisions. I thank you for these people that are being led by your Holy Spirit right now. I pray that you protect their hearts, their mind. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for welcoming us back. God, I thank you for making our path straight. So God, I lift these, these individuals into the palm of your hand and I ask you, God, to just fill them to overflowing with your Holy Spirit, God, that they may wake, make wise decisions. And God, we'll give you all the credit We'll give you all the glory. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, come on, let's give Jesus some praise for his ministry. Thank you so much for joining us today. We pray that this ministry has been a blessing to you. And if it has, would you consider partnering with us financially? You can do that simply through giving through the Rescue House app or making a donation online at our website. And you too can be a part of helping others discover who God made them to be. 
And if today's message impacted you, would you share it with a friend or a family member? And lastly, if you're in the area, we would love to meet you in person. So join us next Sunday at our Moxville campus location. Now, go be who God made you to be.